Well, I want to thank my panel for that, that excellent discussion on abuse deterrent formulations. Thank you for joining us for that discussion. At this point, I'd like to lead into our next uh, segment, which talks about anticonvulsants in the management of neuropathic pain. Um, so let's basically go simple. Charles, why are anticonvulsants used in the management of neuropathic pain? Well, um, it turns out that many conditions that affect the nervous system, including neuropathic pain, you know, pain is, that's pain due to a nerve lesion or injury, and um, involve, for lack of a better term, um, a collection of events that winds up in short-circuiting of the brain and or this peripheral nervous system. And, um, and there are many disorders that affect the central nervous system in which overexcitability, short-circuiting, I'm using vernacular terms for, uh, to be illustrative, um, and anticonvulsants raise the threshold of electrical activity of these segments of the nervous system. And so carbamazepine, for example, which everyone, if you poll audiences at a primary care or any, anyone, even in subspecialty, will say, oh, yeah, carbamazepine, it's, for, it's an anticonvulsant, it's used for seizures, and that's what it was FDA approved for originally. No, it was originally FDA approved in 1970 or 1971 for trigeminal neuralgia. And so anticonvulsants and um, neuropathic pain share this overexcitability potential and actuality in the peripheral and or central nervous system, well, for ep ep epilepsy, it's a central nervous system, but these medications with their different mechanisms can tame that to a certain extent. Chris, how do you know which of these anticonvulsant agents to choose, and what are some of the side effects patients might complain about? Generally speaking, in pain medicine, patients come to us with multiple medical medications. There's already a pill burden that they take on a regular basis because of their other medical problems. So my general gravity is to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and with that, of course, compliance is key. The simpler the regimen, the higher the incidence of compliance. And I think each pill take is, a, is an opportunity for side effects as well. So let's say if you were to take an anticonvulsant three times a day, that three separate pill intakes is an opportunity for somnolence, dizziness, ataxia, and, and GI-related side effects, for example. So therefore, my general uh, clinical tendency is to prefer once-a-day anticonvulsants, uh, once-a-day gabapentin, for example, that is simple and practical where it's important to realize that without adherence, efficacy is a pipe dream. So you have to have compliance in place, and, and with better compliance and with once-a-day administration, you can potentially have a favorable side effect profile as well. Great. Vitaly, you agree uh, having a once-daily neuropathic anticonvulsant agent might help with compliance? Absolutely. A lot of these patients have significant coexisting disease profiles, such as diabetes and organ damage from diabetes. Um, uh, adding three or four uh, pills into their pill box is really burdensome to the patient. So I completely agree with what Chris said. Yeah, you know, one of the challenges that I've found in treating neuropathic pain is unimodal therapy, a single drug, is very rarely effective at capturing or controlling that patient's pain. Uh, Joe, what's your, what's your typical neuropathic pain patient look like and how do you decide which medication to go with and do you practice polypharmacy in that patient? Sure, well, I mean, I think they'll probably be coming in on a rational polypharmacy to begin with. Uh, so now the question is how am I going to address their pain? Is there a potential multi-mechanistic analgesic regimen that I can use that uh, again is, you know, it's almost like being that mad scientist. Uh, you know, it looks very sexy to mix a whole bunch of things together, but do you really get out the results you want? Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I try to uh, provide my patient with a more individualized approach. So unfortunately, by the time they see me, they've probably been through a couple different, what I would call adjuvant or anti-hyperalgesic medications. And uh, what I'll do is I'll go back and find out which one may have been the best for them and exactly what type of a trial they've been on before. Example, um, if you have a patient who has been on a, uh, a lidoderm patch for PHN and they tell you, well, I tried that patch, you know, I went home that night, put it on, and, you know, I didn't get any, any effects, so I, I didn't say anything to my doctor. Then, you know, when I went back a month later, I told him it didn't work. Yeah, but you put it on the one night, <laughs> it's not supposed to work like that. So I think what I try to do is I try to um, 
tailored to my patient's needs. And, and we do have a myriad of different agents we can use. And I try to figure out, you know, is it that I want to work on a descending inhibitory modulation of pain, get that tonic aspect back? Um, do I think there's a real element of central sensitization here, so I want to maybe clamp that system down? Um, can I do something peripherally and centrally together in a multi-mechanistic analgesic regimen? And that's more how I do it, attacking it from that standpoint. And in making my patients understand that most of these drugs, at least all that I know of, there is a period of time that we have to titrate up. And so it's not like you're, if they've had acute pain before, they've had a headache before, and they take a, uh, um, a, a headache medication, your headache's going to go away or it's not, right? And here I tell them, you got to wait. You know, this is something that's going to take a little bit of time to get on board. And uh, I think Chris and Charlie and uh, Vitaly bring up a good point as well. Once you get them to the point where you do have good pain relief, then compliance is an issue. I mean, think about it. If any of us have uh, a medical condition where we have to take a pill three or four times a day, how, how compliant would you be yeah. with the schedules we have? How, w would you be able to take a break during the day? I've never taken a Z-Pack on time. Never, right. Never ever, right? So, um, so it's very difficult to do that. And then particularly, you know, I tend to see a lot of these older patients um, who have neuropathic problems. And I think very, very rightfully said, Vitaly, they, they come in with a three-gallon Ziploc bag of all these medications. I myself can't even figure out half the time what they're doing. We have to sit down write it out, et cetera. So it's critically important that you take all those elements into consideration and not just say, I want this one certain drug or this one certain class of drugs. That sounds great. So, just if, my, oh, if please, I may please. add really quickly, um, Joe brought a, a good point of, of comparing uh, treatment of headache with the prophylactic and abortive medications, I would say of migraine headaches and chronic pain. In many ways, similar. When I was in my training many years ago, I learned from neurologists who were treating headache, add or take away one agent at a time. Uh, because we, a lot of us are involved in the, in the uh, uh, teaching of medical students, residents, or fellows. They come up with a plan and they're eager to add three or four medications at times at the same time. And we would not know, as Joe said, it might take three to six weeks to, to have the full potential of the medication. So we don't know which one is going to work, especially in a patient who is already on several medications which can interact with each other. So my approach would be to add or take away one agent at a time. It sounds like polypharmacy. is.